part of my team culture is I want people to not just have a good understanding of the functions within my team, but also to have a really good knowledge of the different businesses that they work on across the company. Because that knowledge, like it not only helps us be nimble as a team, but it also helps them connect the dots across the business. So we are better business partners to our internal clients. Welcome to Real Creative Leadership, a place where creative leaders can find insights and practical guidance on the day-to-day -day job of being a creative leader. We focus on real issues, topics, and insights of creativity in the business world. Join me as we explore the best strategies for developing your team, getting others to embrace your vision, and generating amazing experiences. This webinar series is produced by The Stoke Group, and I'm your host, Adam Morgan, Adobe Executive Creative Director, and author of Sorry Spock, Emotions Drive Business. And this is Real Creative Leadership. Hello and welcome to this brand new episode of Real Creative Leadership. Today our topic is organizing a creative team and we've got a fantastic guest to help dig into this. His name is Kevin Frank and he's the Executive Creative Director at LinkedIn. In his five-year journey there, he's transformed the company's internal agency into a finely tuned creative machine that has made the ad age best places to work list for two years running and helped the company land a spot on the Interbrand and Brand Z top global brands list. Kevin has also been a creative director for Apple, a freelance creative director on his own, and he's taught advertising at the Academy of Art University. Kevin, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm super psyched to be here. Yeah, maybe let's start out. Can you give us just a brief introduction about your career and your journey as a creative leader? Sure. Um, well, I mean, you've covered a bit of it, but um, I, I would say like the first half of my, my career was working in advertising agencies. Um, first big place that I worked was, was FCB in Chicago. And the first, um, let's say significant place that I worked was, was at Venables Bell here in San Francisco. And I was one of the, I won't say that I'm a founder, but I was, I guess I was one of the charter members. I was, it was me and Bob and Greg and Paul and Lucy and a couple other folks sitting in a, sitting in a nice. room trying to figure out how to, how to build an agency. So yeah, I, I, I learned a ton there. I was, I was able to start my career off in advertising. Um, and then I transitioned over to in-house in my, in my freelance year. So Apple called me up and, and said, Hey, do you want to do a project? And I said, Sure. And then they said, you want to do another project? That was, you know, you did an okay job of that first one. Um, and I said, sure, that sounds good. And that went on for a couple of years until finally they said, hey, how would you feel about working here full time? Uh, and I said, that sounds good. What, uh, what would you like me to do? And they said, well, we need somebody to run global retail. And I said, um, I've never really worked on retail before. <laughs> they said, that's okay. We like, we like the way you think. Um, and so, yeah, it was a, Apple was a huge, huge learning experience. I, mean, I learned how to be a marketer from arguably one of the, the best marketing companies in the world. And I learned how to, how to run a team and I learned how to operate in a, in a corporate environment and, and be successful <laughs> in that kind of environment. After eight years at Apple, uh, I knew you know, I knew that I wanted to continue on in house. I really enjoyed working on on brands that I cared about and 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 being invested in in those brands. I knew that I wanted to build a brand. I knew that I wanted to build a team. I knew that I wanted to work at a place that that I cared about. You know, Apple. I've I've never owned a computer that's not a Mac, and I've never owned mm -hmm. a smartphone that's not an iPhone. And I really believe that Apple makes great stuff, and and that was important to me. And I believe in the mission of LinkedIn and. Uh, yeah, so working at LinkedIn has, has given me an opportunity to to really help people of all kinds on on their career journeys, whatever those journeys look like. And I've been at LinkedIn five years and I don't know, maybe ten days now. I just hit my five year anniversary. <laughs> Down to the days. That's awesome. <laughs> so, so, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm estimating the days. I know the I know the years. Oh, that's awesome. Well, great. Thank you for giving us that background. And now, you know, as we dig into, so clearly you've had a lot of great experience running creative teams, building businesses, building brands. Um, what we want to touch on today is just, yeah, for other people who are either getting into this or who are looking, you know, for some insights on how to do something differently, you and I are just going to have a great conversation about how do we organize our teams? How do we help, you know, keep them, you know, structured, focused on the right things, moving forward to, uh, you know, the North Star, whatever that thing is that, you, that, that you're moving toward. But let's first start out, talk to us about what are the functions on your current team? 
How is your leadership organized? Like, just give us a good lay of the land of your team. Yeah. Um, so, you know, my title is executive creative director, but my job is really a whole lot more like a, a general manager because I have more than just creative reporting up to me. Um, I have, I mean, I have creative and I've got all of the creative functions that, that you would expect. I've got writers and art directors and designers, but I also have a production team and I also have an account service team. Uh, and I also have a, a strategic team. And, you know, that was all really mindfully designed. When I started, my team had, had uh, I, I think LinkedIn was just looking for a place to put a lot of different kinds of creative folks, but it, it hadn't been designed for the needs of the of the business. And so when I came in, I really intentionally decided that we needed all of these functions because there was, there was so much work to be done across the business. Mm, that's great. And I know this is a question that I've tackled so many times. And right now it sounds like most of your team is divided up by function yeah. of like, you know, whether you're in writing or you're in strategy or you're in whatever, but there are a lot of ways to splice up a team. And I know I've done it many different ways in the past and there's no right answer, but yeah. tell me some of the other ways you've maybe had teams organized in the past, like maybe product or media or, or yeah. you know, how that's worked. Um, although I do want to address the first thing you said, um, mm -hmm. where, where I had teams divided up by function. And that's true. I do have very functional teams, but one of the, one of the things that I tell everybody when they start and one of the, the cultural cornerstones of, of my team is that everybody is a creative um, whether you are working on strategy, whether you're, you're an account service person, like everybody has a, has an opinion on creative. Everybody has a creative say, and everybody can contribute to that creative. And so that's, that's part of my philosophy. And likewise, I expect all of my creatives to be able to think strategically and to be able to, to, to manage internal clients. So part of, part of having a small team is that I, I need, people to do, to do lots of different functions and, and understand lots of different functions. Um, so, you know, asking about like organizing a team by function, it, it really is a function of the resources that you have. Like, I don't think that there's, I don't think that there's a right answer to that. And I don't think that one model is necessarily better than the other. It just sort of depends what, what business challenges you're solving for and how many people you have. So for example, at Apple, um, I don't, you know, I left Apple five years ago and I'm not privy to how many people are at Marcom now, but I think it's probably, it, it's gotta be around 1500 people. And so, yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, if I had 1500 people, then, then you can build a company, uh, you can build a team of specialists. And I think having, having people who are highly specialized either in function or in the businesses that they work on is really valuable, right? You have that expertise, you have people gain that knowledge of one particular piece of the business. But again, you need to have a lot of people to do that, especially in a big company. LinkedIn is, I think, almost 20,000 20, people now. So for me, uh, the reason that, that I went to a functional model rather than a, a model um, around product or, or line of business was, was really a numbers game. Um, and again, like part of my team culture is I want, I want people to not just have a good understanding of the functions within my team, but also to have a really good knowledge of the, the different businesses that they, that they work on across the company, because that knowledge, like it not only helps us be nimble as a team, but it also helps them connect the dots across the business. So we are better business partners to our, to our internal clients. You know, the other, the other benefit to going broader or, or to, to leaning into functionality versus, um, versus product or, or the line of business that, that, that people are working on is for the, is, it's like, when I think about my team's, my team's growth as individuals, um, it really like enables them to have a deeper understanding of the whole business. So therefore that puts them in a position to, to have more growth opportunities. The more that they know about the business, the more people across the business respect what they do. And the more that, that, that I can make the case for them to, you know, to, to advance in their careers, either at LinkedIn or, or in other places. Oh, I totally agree with that. Yeah. I love all that you're saying, like not just <clears throat> by function, but cross-functional Yeah, and helping them. It's the same thing, you know, and once you become a leader in, at least in the creative field, you have to be cross-functional. You have to be able to direct writing and video and 
yeah. art direction and all of those things. So I think learning those skills along the way in one form or another is pretty critical. Yeah. And, it, and it's cross-functional, not just in the sense of, you know, within my own team, having, you know, an art director understand the business side of things or a strategist understand how to think creatively. It's, it's cross-functional across all of the, the internal clients that we work on. So the ability, the, the more, the more, different businesses that you understand and different business models, both within LinkedIn and, and, you know, that you can extrapolate to other places that they might work down the road, like that's only going to benefit them. Um, and, and, and the more kinds of people that you interact with, the more personality types, the more nuances that you learn, that's only going to help you be a better business person down the road as well. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Great. Great advice. Thank you so much. Sure. For example, at Adobe, we've acquired several different um, companies and, and it's been interesting for me to see how those creative teams have functioned in different companies based on size again. And I think you were right. Like when they're smaller, it's definitely more of a, a cross-functional thing. Like you, you have to work across the whole business. You have to understand it all. You have to, you have to get it. And I've seen also where there's been like a growth phase where they're halfway between where it's like, they're not quite big enough as like an Apple where there's just tons and tons of people, but halfway in between. And we get into this world of like, do you create just a pool of creatives? And then the tickets come in and whoever's up first gets, you know, first in, first out, whatever it is. And everyone works on everything yeah. versus specialized. Cause I've also seen some of them where there's, they're organized by media type too. Where it's like, Oh, you work on the website, you work only on email yeah. campaigns, you work on yeah. advertising, you work on whatever. So there's just, it's again, it's like a matrix. There's so many ways to split things and I'm sure it's no right answer, but I think you can cross tabulate or, or cut it up however you want, but the pool thing, and I've had to do that at agency several times and all, you know, my early days at Adobe and I kind of moved away from the pool thing. Just, I don't know. I felt like people didn't have that ownership. Like what you have with your team is the cross-functional ownership where everyone's like sees all does all, but they're not, they're not just kind of removed from the process where I've seen in some of these pool models, or like an account person up front takes in all the tickets and then there's just a slew of designers in the background churning away. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think um, to the first thing you were saying about, you know, as, as you grow, like there's that kind of ambiguous area between you're not quite big enough to be specialized and, and not small enough to, to have everybody work on everything. It's, it's, it's really interesting that you say that because that's exactly what I'm thinking about right now. Um, <laughs> so, you know, and, you know, we, we are at a point in our growth where we, you know, we have enough people and we have enough um, work coming in from, from our internal clients that it, it may make sense to organize in a, in a slightly different way. And also the needs of the business have, have shifted. And I would say have gotten more focused in the, in the five years and, and uh, 10 days I've, I've been at LinkedIn. Um, <laughs> So, you know, so what I'm thinking about right now is, is somewhere in between that idea of, you know, everybody works on everything and we have, you know, 1500 specialists that, that just work on very specific things. So it's, it's a model where, well, what if I had a, what if I had a team that just focused on, on our B2B units? Cause, cause LinkedIn does so much B2B, but again, like within that, the folks who would be in that pod, let's say, might work on all the different B2B units. And there's mm -hmm. any one of our business to business units is like, is an entire client in and of itself. There's plenty to go around. So the ability, I think, to work on multiple business units, if if you sit within that, that team, there's still a lot of good creative opportunity. It's still a lot of different things you can work on. Another um, sort of pod that I'm thinking about is, is what if we had a systems team? So one of the things that that my team does is we've helped um, lead the development of the, the brand guidelines that, that we did. So, and again, there's like plenty to dig into there. It's the brand is, as you, I'm sure know, like brand guidelines are not a thing that you do and are done. They constantly- Endless, change. endless. Yeah, they're endless, <laughs> exactly. They, ne they never end, um, you know, because they're always new, you know, the, the world is changing, the business is changing, the needs of the marketers are changing. And so we need to evolve those guidelines and those systems to, to, to be current. Um, and so again, like within a systems kind of team, I think there's, there's plenty for, for creatives to dig into. Um, the other thing that LinkedIn has really been thinking about a lot lately is, um, 
is this idea of creators. And, and that is like people who are creating great content on LinkedIn so that more people are, are coming to the platform to engage with that content, um, hopefully giving those creators feedback about how to make better content themselves. And then um, the people who are coming to LinkedIn, if they're inspired to create their own content, then driving those ecosystems. So this whole this whole creator ecosystem is really important to the business right now. And so having a team that could be dedicated to that um, and, and, and be able to both produce that kind of content and react to things that are happening in the world in real time, I think is going to be really valuable. But again, like there's not one kind of creator. So I think there's going to be a lot to dig into there. So, so anyway, the way that I'm thinking about the team now is this, this sort of like hybrid model of you, you work on specific things, but there's enough, there's enough variety within those specific things to, to still enable my team to connect those dots and work really cross-functionally. Mm. Yeah. And I think the takeaway for me, in, no matter how you slice it, um, it's giving some ownership and accountability. Yeah, absolutely. Whether that ownership is of a specific client or a specific group or a specific you know, need in the business, but then so they can own it and then have, be accountable for it, but still cross-functional so that they're not stifled. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, I mean, that's one of the ways that you keep teams motivated, right? Is you want them to feel that ownership. You want them to, to feel vested in the business that they're working on, as well as the, the broader mission of LinkedIn. Like they want to be guiding that process and, and feel like they're making a real difference. Um, and that's, that's again, one of the ways that I, that I motivate my team is to, you know, give them those ownership opportunities to help them see that no matter what they're working on, doesn't matter what line of business, what project, like it is all important to what LinkedIn does. And it's all important to our, to our mission. Cool. Let's pivot a little bit onto another topic, which is, okay, you mentioned once before that you had like 800 marketers that you have to satisfy. And I totally resonate with that. I feel like there's always a thousand marketers to a handful of creatives in, in any given business. But as you're working with them, it's a challenging to keep up with all of those different people. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about how you organize the work or how do you prioritize the work? How do you make sure the important stuff gets done without, you know, things falling off. Yeah. It's, um, I mean, it all comes back to the relationships that we have with those marketers. And, and, you know, I don't know all 800 of, of the marketers that <laughs> work at LinkedIn and they're probably more than 800 now. Um, mm-hmm. So, but, but what I have done, what, you know, when I joined LinkedIn, the relationships with the different, with the different marketers were kind of in different States. And so I've invested most of my time and and the time that I've been here getting to know marketers as people um, and I, as well as getting to know their businesses. And so through those conversations, through that constant contact, that's what, that's the foundation for, for helping me prioritize their work. So I can have a conversation with them and say, Hey, what's important to you this quarter. Now, on top of that, I mean, we do have formal processes that we've put in place, um, that that help us priorities to prioritize. So again, for when I when I started, it was very much piecemeal. You know, we had to build the relationships so that the marketers were comfortable enough to come to us and say, "Hey, can you work on this thing?" Um, but but that the, the next phase of that was those things coming to us piecemeal and us doing the best that we could to um, you know to do a good job of them. One of the things that, that I've done in the last couple of years is we brought on a, a creative services manager, which we really, really needed. And by the way, she is also, even though her title is creative services manager, she is dedicated to making great work and thinking strategically mm-hmm. and managing client relationships and doing all of the things across the, the business that I, that I want everybody to do. So I actually have a, a position that helps manage that now. And one of the systems that she's put in place is a quarterly meeting with mm-hmm. every single um, business unit that we work with across LinkedIn. And we sit down six weeks before the, the beginning of any quarter. And we talk about all the projects that they have coming up. Um, and we work with them to, to prioritize. So again, it's not, it's not me saying like, this is the most important thing for the business. Cause I don't know that I can look at a thing and say, wow, I think this is a really great creative opportunity and I want to work on it. Um, but I can't tell a marketer that a thing is more, you know, I can't say to you, like, this is the most important thing to you because 
you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't. They're all a tier one. They're all, (laughs) they're everything. Yeah. (laughs) I just, I can't tell you what's important to you. You only know that. Um, So yeah, so we have a formal process now that that we, we sit down with the marketers prior to the beginning of a quarter. We talk about you know, their priorities. We talk about the, the things that we see as, as really good creative opportunities. And, and we, we, we prioritize it that way. And, and for the things that we can't do ourselves, one of the other ways in which we're organized, one of the other services that we provide is to be a bit of a consultant for our internal clients. So we might recommend a great agency for them to work with. Um, if they already have an agency that, that they work with, we, we will often help manage that agency and sit in those meetings with them. So, so again, like we're able to prioritize that work. We're able to take on what we can do based on the priority of that work and the bandwidth that we have. And then for what we can't do, um, we, we help guide the process as much as we can. Well, there are several things that I'd love to respond to on that. Number one, the fact that you say relationships, like you're, how, do, how do you do your work? And the first thing you said is relationships. And there's an earlier presentation I did on becoming a creative director. And I put that at the top. Like relationships are so critical. Yeah. It's all about the work, the work, the work. And it's like, it starts with the, with the other people. (laughs) Well, they're they're not mutually exclusive. It it, it can still be all about the work, the work, the work, but the way to sell the work, the work, the work is to have that, that relationship with your, with your client or with your team. Um, You know, having that, having that baseline of understanding where, I'm not showing up and, you know, doing, doing the dog and pony show. Cause you know, no client wants that. They just, they want to have a conversation. They want to understand that, that we understand their business and, and they want an agency that they can trust. And the way that you get there is, is you have that relationship as the foundation. And that's true. You know, one of, one of LinkedIn's central tenets is that relationships matter. I mean, we are a social network, which mm-hmm. is all about relationships. And so that is, very, very central to our culture and very true of LinkedIn, but that's true anywhere you work, but it's all, it's all built on relationships. Uh, the second thing is just how you talked about the priorities and tiers. And that's the same thing we have in Adobe. There's like, yeah. if we did a tier one, two, three, where it was like tier one is the stuff, like the high level stuff that we're going to really focus on. And, you know, a majority of my team is going to focus on that. A tier two, we may bring in contractors or other people working with and kind of work halfway on all of those things. Then in a tier three model is like, that's important, but we're going to, you know, basically go out with an outside agency and use them as an extension of our team. And I think whoever out there, you know, creative leaders, however you want to organize, great. But I see more and more, that's the system, just like you're saying, you're involved and you own the relationship with that agency. And I think that's so critical. And that's how we do it too, where it's like, instead of marketers just running off willy nilly, picking whatever agency they want and just kind of going rogue, yeah. we as the brand ambassadors of owning the, the execution of the brand and the execution of all creative, own those relationships with agencies. And it's easier for us to talk creative to creative and know what we need to get at. And so being able to guide that is super critical. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and just, just to clarify, like I, because I don't want to misrepresent what we do. Like I don't, I don't own the relationship with every agency that we work with. And That's fair. Yeah, neither. I, I would. I would love to. And <laughs> that is a thing that I'm working towards. But that's the relationships that I have and my team has with different agencies is sort of different on a client to client basis. And again, sometimes it is owning that relationship. And and I try very hard to have one on ones with different. ECDs or CCOs at the agency that we work with just to make sure that we're on the same page and, and talk about the work. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's different for every, for every internal client sure. that we work with. Sure. So maybe let's focus on the next thing is, which is, okay, so beyond just the actual nuts and bolts of, of, of getting the work done, there's also a big aspect of how do you keep your leadership team on the same page? How do you keep them all collectively focused on building the brand collectively. So maybe talk to me more a little bit about how do you interact with your leadership? What kind of things do you guys do? What do you, how do you like talk about the issues or keep focused or have a vision? Let's, let's just think more of like the interpersonal stuff. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's, it's both very complicated and very simple. So the simple answer is communication, mm. right? Lots and lots and lots and lots of communication. So I have one-on-ones with all of my leadership team every single week. I meet with them as a team every single week. I meet with my whole team every single week. Um, I I share as much as I possibly can about what I'm 
what I'm hearing in the business. Um, I tend to, when I listen, I tend to listen for things that come up a lot. And so if I hear the same things come up two or three times in a single conversation or in a single week, I'm like, ah, oh, that's a thing I probably should pay special attention to. And that's a thing that I make sure to, to let my, my team know about. So just like the way that, that you sell great work or you, or you get your business partners or clients to agree to do great work is based on relationships. And there's a lot of nuance to that. The way that, that I make sure my team knows what's going on and understands the business and has the tools that, that they need to, to be great at their jobs. It's, it's communication. I guess maybe drilling into that a little yeah. bit is, it sounds like your team is cohesive enough and communicating and having enough meetings that they're all on the same page. I can imagine though, back when you were at Apple with huge teams or, you know, a large agency, how do you keep silos from forming or how do you like, are there any other tips and tricks around the right yeah. way to communicate? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, at Apple, it was inevitable that silos formed because mm. I, I think, I, I don't think my, I'm, I don't think I'm still covered by NDA, but I don't think I'm going to say anything that's uh, I don't, I don't think I'm going to say anything that's radical. So but at Apple, secrecy is, is one of the things that, that they really mm. value. And so you could be working on a project at Apple and not know what project the person next to you was working on. So, so in a culture like that, and I'm just addressing this because you brought it up, silos are inevitable, mm. or at least work okay. silos. Um, I don't have that same challenge at LinkedIn. Um, LinkedIn is a much more open culture. And, and while things are confidential, they're not, they're, there's not a culture of secrecy. So I have, I have the, the luxury of being able to communicate to my team what work projects are going on so that they connect those dots. Um, but on the, just on the cultural side of things, you know, I, I really try hard to make sure that my people stay connected. And obviously with the last couple of years with, with, with the pandemic, like that's not an easy thing to do. Um, so again, remotely, when I do, when I do my, my weekly team meetings, we set a little bit of time aside at the very beginning just to go in a breakout room with one or two other people and talk about what, what you did that weekend, right? We do a month. Oh, that's morning, interesting. And like it, sub rooms? Yeah. So, yeah. So, so, so again, if there's, you know, there, there are 30 or 35 of us in the team meeting um, for the first five minutes, we, we go into a sub breakout room with one other person and you just, you know, you just connect with them. Um, we had remote holiday parties and, and team gatherings for a while and, and happy hours. Now that we are, um, now that we are able to start to get back together in person and, you know, hopefully uh, Omicron will, will be a thing of the past soon we are going to start getting back together in person. So we've got a team event planned for this coming week. It's still outside, you know, it's still, it's still hopefully um, going to be safe. And, and uh, you know, I, I tell my entire team, like, Hey, if you don't feel comfortable for whatever reason, not coming to a team event, like you don't have to come, it's totally okay. Um, but I, but, but now that it seems safer to do that, I want the team to have opportunities to get together in person. One of the other things we're talking about, like many, many other companies are talking about is how do we, how do we go back to the office? Mm -hmm. um, and again, I want to be really mindful of not making anybody feel like they have to go back to the office, but I also understand how crucial that is for, for team coherence. So, you know, I'm going to start very gently saying like, Hey, if you want to go in the office one day a week, you know, Let's just, let's pick a day. Let's say it's Thursday. And if you want to come in, you come in and you'll see who's there. Um, but again, just, just having that, that kind of thing. So in addition to the projects that you work on, having those, those personal connections and, and not just finding opportunities, but, but making opportunities for those personal connections is really important to me. What about beyond your team? Um, in, you know, not just in the relationships, but, you know, how do you influence the company to, you know, change the a direction on how, you know, I don't know, the work is going in a bigger way, in a different way. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there, I wish there was an easy answer to that. There are a lot of things that we do. One, one of the things that, that we've put in place is a bit of an education system for, for different partners. So one of the things uh, my production team has put together is, is what's called the production 101 deck. And, mm. um, you know, a lot of, I don't want to say a lot, but, you know, some, some, 
internal clients don't always know everything that it, it takes to get done to, to do a, a video, for example. It's not just go shoot the video and it's done. There's editing, there's coloring, there's sound mixing, you know, there's, there's, there's trafficking, there's, you know, getting network clearance if it's going to be on television, like there are all those other things. So it's not just like, you know, why can't you do a video in two weeks? Uh, <laughs> it's, Take it's, your phone out, just go out there and make yeah, it. Yeah, right? just go out there and make it. Um, so, you know, and again, that's, that's not, to, I'm not, uh, just to be clear, like, I'm not like holding that against anybody. I'm not blaming anybody. I just know that, that in some cases there is a, there's not an understanding of what it takes to, to make the creative. And so putting this together is to say like, Hey, just so you understand, here are the things that it takes to do that. So, you know, we can be better partners to you because you understand our process and, and, and vice versa. Um, another presentation or deck that we put together was um, how to give feedback to creatives. Mm, I think, yeah. um, I think that's a thing. I mean, it's, it's really hard for for creative folks to give feedback to each other. It's hard. You know, we've all worked for creative directors who, have one thing in their mind and they're not, you know, they're really afraid to say it. <laughs> and then it, it turns into a, you know, how do you, how do I, you know, draw this thing out that I know my, my creative director wants. Um, so it's, it's, it's hard to give creative feedback because, yeah. and especially at LinkedIn, because we are such a culture of collaboration. And I think, you know, we all genuinely like each other. We don't want to hurt each other's feelings. And so, that's there's value to all that but on the other side of the equation is is if we don't get the feedback that we need it slows down the work and it makes the work not as good and so we put together a deck about hey here's here's how to give us feedback here are the kinds of things you can you can say to us that that get us energized so for example you know identifying identifying problems that you would like us to solve as opposed to solutions that you've already come to mm. is, is a is a really central one and, you know, and, and just, I mean, things as basic as saying like, wow, that, that took a lot of work to get here. Thank you. And again, I, I don't think that that's the, I think that's more the exception to the rule at LinkedIn specifically, because I, I think people do a really good job of, of appreciating each other, but, you know, just out in the world that, that hasn't always been my experience. So anyway, like that's one of the ways that we get to better work is again, through like partnerships and relationships, but, but built on educational tools that, that we have created. Yeah, that's that's something we've been doing too. In fact, we just put together how you almost may call it like a menu of here are all the different types of videos that we make, yeah. you know, from little short stingers to social to yeah. this, to that, like the explainers animated. And we walk through in that document of like, here's how much, you know, either an on-site shoot or how much money it would cost to do this or how long you'd need for, you know, animation, all those things that like, at least a little short list, a cheat sheet of like what it takes to put together all these videos. And I think it's really helpful so that, because it's easy to look in the black box from the outside and be like, oh, they just make videos and do it faster and I want it good. But yeah. I agree with you. Like sometimes those guidelines do help a lot in educating and getting people on your side. Yeah, I mean, one of the other things we do too is just to, to share work that inspires us. You know, I mean, hmm. I think if I'm talking about guidelines or, you know, or best practices or any of that stuff, like that's all in the abstract. But you know, a, a TV commercial or a printout or a website, like that's all, that's all real. And so we try to share those on a, on a regular basis with, with other folks in the company and say, Hey, here's a thing that, that we really like, and that we think is really good. And beyond that to say, and here's why we think it's good. Here's the business problem it's solving, or here is the production. Here's why the production quality is, is appropriate for the message, or here's why the writing really sings. So those, those things that get us excited will hopefully get our business partners excited as well. Well, Kevin, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for all this great advice. I mean, you know, it's just, just peering, you know, pulling back the curtains and seeing like a day in the life of how all of us work and, and get good creative out the door is just, is just fascinating. Well, thank you so much. This has been a fantastic episode. Uh, just in closing, where can viewers and listeners find you follow your career learn more about you well they can they can find me on linkedin as funny you uh, should say this. <laughs> as you might expect yeah. um yeah i think that's the that's the best place to find me connect with me say hi to me um see what i'm up to in closing you can always find us at realcreativeleadership.com we've got a catalog of past shows that you can watch a lot of great topics and things to dig into. You can also email and ask a question and suggest a future topic, or just follow Real Creative Leadership on all the major social channels or on your favorite podcast platform, whatever that may be. 
personally, you can find me at adamwmorgan.com or on LinkedIn, just like Kevin. That's where, you know, I usually post stuff. Um, and you can learn more about The Stoke Group, the digital marketing and content agency that produces the show at thestokegroup.com. Regardless of however you engage, we'd love you to engage with us in some way. Leave a comment about the shows, share an, an episode with someone else, or put make a comment on social media. So we appreciate it. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you at our next show. Thanks for listening to Real Creative Leadership. I'm your host, Adam Morgan. This series is produced by The Stoke Group a full-service digital marketing agency that specializes in content marketing, video, and interactive experiences. If you're looking for a partner to build a strategy and content that delivers, visit thestokegroup.com and connect today.